Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. It's again here, Stefan Swanepoel. It is May the 8th, and this would have been the week which we would have had our 8th T3 Summit. And we uh, regret very much that we're not be able to uh, get together with our 400 or so friends, colleagues of the industry. Uh, we would have been at the La Cantera Hotel at the, uh, San Antonio this week. And I must honestly say, I, although it's a, it's a pain in the butt every year to arrange the event and to try and coordinate everything, it is one of the most... Uh, exciting things that I have and I always look forward to seeing the amount of people because we've been able to get so many leaders. We decided to invite two leaders that were going to be at the T3 Summit and that had agreed to be on stage together at the T3 Summit and so I feel that we wanted to get them together and we were very blessed when we were able to pull them still together. So uh, I know my host is here Jack but Jack and I welcome uh, John Payton and Ryan Gorman. Thanks for joining us today guys. Our pleasure. Thank you for having us. We're excited to be here virtually. Would have preferred to be in San Antonio, but this is a next best thing. Yes. Actually, yes. to be clear, I would prefer to be with Stefan in Hawaii right now. As we're <laughs> preparing for a bomb cyclone snowstorm here in the Northeast, and it is May. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, that's not really Hawaii. Isn't that just one of those fake backdrops, Stefan? Hawaii. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, 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 sort of, sort of a blessing in disguise, uh, John. Uh, my wife and I, over the last 10 years, have been sort of planning a vacation home and saving and bought a piece of property and designed something. And then about six years ago, we started drawing our own plan and we decided we were going to build something. And the contractor called at the beginning of this year. Uh, we had been here for many site visits, but called and said, I'm basically done. You guys can come pick up the keys and we'll create a punch list. So in February, when, when, when Corona was still at the very early stages, we thought we'll just sneak away quickly for a weekend or maybe a week and just quickly go do the punch list, go look, work, work through things. And we were at the office when, when Jack and, and our management team called me and said, listen, uh, some new news has come out and we actually believe that it's getting firmer. They haven't announced a stay at home order yet, but we think it's coming in the next week and we want to be ahead of the curve. We're going to announce a T3 stay at home order a week before it actually comes out. So you don't have to come back until the stay at home order. And I thought, oh, so I'll extend my stay for a week. And this is now my ninth week at my vacation home in Hawaii, which was not intended, but it is absolutely delightful. Well, yeah, no that, doubt. That, assuming you've been wearing that shirt every day for eight weeks, it's holding up pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> no, this one is, this morning is just for you, John. I, I had a white one on yesterday and a pink one on, on Wednesday. <laughs> this one's for you because I knew you guys were blue. I'm trying to, I'm trying to match with the, your t-shirts. I, I did get the memo, I get the memo. Good. Well, uh, thank you very much. We wanted just to talk to you guys today, just like Fireside Friday chat. This is uh, amongst colleagues and friends. We just wanted to talk about the, the industry in general, your companies in general. How are you holding up personally from a family point of view? How are the immediate management teams around you holding up? And how, how's the company and the brand holding up? Just a general discussion. Share with us a little bit. Sure. Well, John's had uh, more firsthand experience with this. So maybe, John, you want to give your, uh, your tale of, of woe and overcome? So I think Ryan is um, alluding to the fact, Stefan, that um, uh, I had uh, COVID, as did my wife and my Ooh. son. He, my, my son, um, the boy wonder, was thoughtful enough to bring it home from college with him. And um, it's everything. Here's the good news. We're all fully recovered. And none of us had the respiratory issues or the, you know, the, the hospitalization issues. We had, if you know, if you listen to Chris Cuomo on CNN, we, it's a really, 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 really bad flu. And um, it's highly contagious, just like you read. He came home on Sunday. My wife had it on Monday. And I had it on Tuesday. And we all tested positive on a Wednesday. Um, wow. Yeah. But the good news is we're, we're on the other side of it. It's been four weeks since we were symptom-free. Um, I've donated plasma last week because I have the antibodies so that others can benefit from it, as did my wife. And, and I can do that every 10 days. So I'm about ready to do it again. But um, it's everything you hear about. It's, it's unpleasant, but now I'm superhuman and I can go outside and <laughs> greet strangers. <laughs> wow, wow. So the, the stay at home order really has meant a lot to you even before your son came home and then, and then as a result of your son coming home. Yes, and um, my daughter does not have it. So she came home from college. We sent her to the neighbors for three weeks. So we did a good job of 
bringing her back in at the right time and cleaning the house. And so we still have to be very careful because we have one person in the house who doesn't have it. So we have to be careful about where we go and what we bring back, just like everybody else. Well, I am very I'll, I'll admit now, I didn't, I didn't then. Um, if you ever see John and I together, we spend most of our time just making fun of one another. But I was legitimately scared. Uh, you know, John, it was it was tough. You know, I mean, John and I were talking all the time. We're working together constantly, and uh, I was worried. I was worried about the the Peyton family. We obviously have COVID a lot. We're in a hot spot. We have a lot in the community here. We've been we've been hit hard at Coal Banker. We unfortunately had losses in the in the Asian community, and, um, and it's intense. But just watching John go through it, he tried to soldier through it. He'd patch into calls and whatnot, and then have to go and rest up and whatnot. And, uh, you know, I did make fun of him a little less for a few days, which was hard for all of us, really. <laughs> but now that, her, now that he has I classified himself as superhuman and yes. that you have Superman Peyton, then maybe I think you can start making fun of him again. I yes. think that might be open license, open license. Well, yes. uh, John did not know, did not know, uh, of course, on behalf of myself, T3, and I, I'll do it on behalf of the industry, all of your competitors and all of those that love you and hate you and see you as a competitor, we are all thankful, delighted that you made it through healthy and that your family is safe. And I am sure that even your worst enemies are glad to have you in the industry and hope that you will have much to do and much to change and still lots to build in our industry. We want you very much and we're thankful that you're still around. Thank you. And your, your comments uh, toward, toward the industry are much more magnanimous than my comments toward my son have been. <laughs> uh, patient zero is not always the welcome one oh, no yes. no tough tough well tell us a little bit about uh, while while uh, john was taking a well-deserved and unexpected three-week hiatus at home uh, ryan you doubled up and you did a little bit more work at the office tell us about some of the stuff which went on in the office that we would know about yeah, sure. I mean, I've been I've been uh, you know carrying the dead weight of uh, of John for for a long time, but that was the most sort of that was the most obvious to everyone uh, at that time. We actually Ryan Schneider, Realty CEO, he did actually pull us together early on and say, hey, everyone needs a backup plan. You know, if one of us gets sick, you need you need a plan. And John and I were one another's uh, backup plan. Uh, which, you know, I committed to easily thinking it wouldn't happen. And then, you know, of course, slacker that he is, he goes, he goes right to plan uh, to plan B. But fortunately, the two of us actually think relatively similarly, um, even though one's clearly more handsome than the other. And I was able to, to step in uh, a little bit and John's returned the favor by stepping in for me a fair bit as well. So we were able to kind of keep going. And as a company, honestly, that's uh, sort of remarkably, we were able to pivot, even though we're so... Uh, sort of real estate centric, you know, as a company, everyone kind of comes to work every day, everyone works around the clock, but there's a, a fair bit of work that takes place in the office. We pivoted in a span of, I think we announced on a Thursday afternoon that we were going to kind of go virtual. I want to say like three quarters of the company was virtual by Friday and Monday morning. It was like, we'd already worked out all the kinks and figured everything out and we were kind of cruising, which I would never, never have predicted. All of our disaster recovery plans never predicted us to be able to do it that smoothly. Um, and we did, you know, necessity, the mother of invention, I guess. That's what we saw. And I, I, think, I was going to say, Stefan and Jack, in addition to how quickly the company went virtual, I think one of the strategies that we employed that makes sense for Realogy, makes sense for our brands, makes sense for our owners, a team leader, an individual agent, is that, you know, during a crisis like this, you've got to play offense and defense. And I think, you know, that the companies that, that sort of go dark, and, and really just play defense are going to struggle to own the upswing that, you know, that is inevitable. So, you know, it's, it, it's, it's all very public information, but Realogy, we did salary cuts, we did hourly cuts, we did, um, uh, you know, freezing 401k contributions, all of the things that one would expect. We did furloughs, you know, that was the defense, but at the same time, and we continue to invest in things that we need to do so that we have momentum coming out of, out of this. So, you know, we carved out our technology investments. Those are ongoing during, during the pandemic. You know, we carved out certain new partnerships like we have with AARP. That investment still happens during the pandemic. So, you know, we have this um, mantra, you know, of own the upswing or own the recovery and that it's, it's not just about being um, prudent with our cash and, and, and being strong for the, the long term, not knowing how long this will last, but knowing that we want to be ready with momentum coming out of it 
and it's why we're still investing in these programs, as well as, as, as Ryan said, all the virtual tools that our agents and owners are using now as well. Yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll add to that. So John's background, you know, I think you, you, you both know this, uh, Jackson, but John's background, it, you know, obviously hospitality, but before that consulting, change management, et cetera. So he really, John is actually responsible, all kidding aside, for really helping step up our game of internal and external communications. And he brought in Trace Art and the whole, the whole group does an amazing job. But John's, one of the things I've learned a lot from, from John is his idea of how and when we should communicate the frequency, the authenticity and all that kind of stuff is just like worlds beyond what we had been doing before, before he joined. And if it were not for that, then I don't think we would have handled this as well. Cause we just a level of communication that we started doing immediately. I mean, the amount of daily communication, weekly communication, what we recommended our broker owners do our agents do with their customers and everything. It was a, it was just a sea change from not just as an industry, but even where we were as a company. And it's, paid off a lot because we've had a lot of people tell us that we're helping them to just de-stress a bit and just feel like they got this like we can do this and and, and they're pivoting as well and so all kidding aside uh you know john will probably make fun of me for saying it later but like truly i learned that from john and we as an organization pivoted because of what john brought to the table and it's and that's the networks of all the brands have really felt that and benefited from it i think it's fascinating to see who steps up and then how they step up and what they actually do may be better than what they would have done under normal circumstances. Jack and I have also noticed that there are, you mentioned communication, but there are a few things, communication is one of them, that we actually feel we have in the last eight weeks done better than what we normally did. And we didn't think we were doing it too lousy before, right? We thought we were okay with it, right? And, and if you look at the amount of activity which you did on a certain activity, you now look back and say, well, I really was terrible at it before. I thought I was okay, but I've now shown to myself I can actually do way more. Yep, I'm, I'm very grateful. Uh, I'm, before I throw the, the ball over to, to, to my partner, Jack, I'll give you guys credit. You mentioned the salary cuts which Rilogy took or announced. Uh, Jack and I was exactly at the same level at T3. We had had uh, two, two conference calls, what we call EXCO, Executive Committee calls, where we were discussing uh, salaries, furlough, not furlough, keeping all the staff, which we ultimately decided not one staff member would go, we would hold on to as many because we're a smaller company, we could do that. And then we said we would take salary cuts, all the partners would say, take salary cuts. So we had already taken that decision, but we were now in our own heads arguing, is it going to be 25% or 30% or 40% or 50%? We were trying to come up with a number. And, and we were, I wouldn't say we were on the fence, but we were still debating it, right? but fairly aggressively when you guys announced your, your cuts. And just the fact that you brought it on the table when we were in-house discussing it, you caused us to execute that decision the same day, which we, we were thinking about it, but when we saw you guys do it, we said, yes, we thought it was the right thing, but you've now shown us it's the right thing. And Jack and I both took a 50% salary cut that same day. So we do think wow. it's the right thing for management to step up. Yep. Wow. Well, I appreciate you telling us like, that our, our affiliates of, of, uh, and, and franchises and stuff have, have similarly said when we've, one of the things we've tried to do is when we've made decisions and communicated stuff out, we've also given it to them in more detail just so they can, not that they need to make the same decision, but they have some, some template, another data point to just look at and sort of make their own decisions, which uh, they've shared has been helpful. So it's good. And we're doing the same stealing from every industry in the country, just trying to figure out our own decisions as well. And I think, I think Stefan, you also hit on something that's, that is going to survive the crisis, which is the way we communicate and the way we work. And we're all saying that now that we're off planes and not in hotel rooms and, you know, at, at conferences week after week after week, that one of the benefits of this is that, you know, each of us is talking to more of our team members, more of our partners. I'm talking to more of the owners of our affiliated brands than I've ever had time to do before. And everyone is feeling the same thing. And so one of the big things that Realogy is focusing on is short term and long term of how we come back to work. You know, short term is how do you come back to work while the virus is still a threat and all of the safety protocols. But the but the more exciting piece of work that we're doing is post vaccine, right? When when the world is safe again, uh, we don't think we go back to work the way we did before. And that and that the way we work going forward, whether it's at a corporate headquarters or even at a brokerage office, is there's gonna be much more blended work work um, model for all of us from Ryan Schneider, our CEO on down to an office manager of work from home and work in the office because we're finding that there's elements of productivity, 
job satisfaction, avoiding commutes um, that people are enjoying, and that it, it enables us to rethink what's the purpose of a headquarters building? What's the purpose of a brokerage office? How much space do you need? Why do people come to the office? And we're encouraging all of our affiliates to think about the same thing is, is we're all learning and the learning curve here is accelerated by light years, right? Because of the crisis that, that work will look differently, the way we work, where we work, when we work going forward. I think it's also helping us think about what requires face-to-face -face and, and you know, what's crucial for travel versus what can be accomplished in a medium like this. Uh, you said one word which I'd like to, to just uh, accentuate and then, and then I'm going <laughs> to have Jack jump in. I've taken over. Sorry, Jack. Apologize. Okay. No, uh, okay. You said yeah, accelerate. It's never happened to you before, Jack. Never. <laughs> <laughs> never. <laughs> uh, John, you said a word which I like, which is accelerate. Uh, on another conference call, somebody else asked me and said, well, what is, has COVID or, or Corona created and how's the change in the industry? And, and that was similar to my answer to what you said. COVID hasn't really created a lot of things. What it has, it, it has accelerated trends and technology. We had Zoom before COVID. COVID didn't create Zoom. We've now just used it more. We, we have always had struggles to travel or not to travel, to attend or not to attend or to do certain things. But the, the stay at home order has forced us to do things, as Grian said, more efficiently, more effectively, more frequently, or slightly differently. But it hasn't really created something new, but it has accelerated with a big speed the change that's happening. Okay, Jack, yours. You had a, you had, you have some yeah, ideas. Yeah, so well, I, I just want to say we're, we're seeing like some of this change in communication style. We have some of your, there's some of your franchisees that we do some work with, and we've seen it at that level in how they're communicating. And I, I was on a, a call, uh, there's a daily, uh, uh, web call that one of your franchisees does that had 650 of his agents on it uh, that he's done every day for the last 30, 35, 40 days. Uh, and it was really impressive to see that um, kind of at, at the brokerage level, that step up in communication and kind of transparency and commitment. So, so I, I just want to say that we, we're experiencing it through some of the clients that we work with and seeing it, how it's impacting their operations, which brings me to just kind of a conversation. What do you think is, is, uh, has, has worked? Like, what do you see happening in the brokerage environment that's working well or that's shifted or changed it? What, what sort of feedback are you getting from your network? What things are they telling you? Cause you're connected to a lot of people and I'm just curious what they're, what they're saying and what you listen. Well, I mean, so what you just mentioned is, is a big part of it. So even just the level of connectedness. So, two big things we're seeing, for instance, office meetings. We, we've used Microsoft Teams similar to, yep. to, to Zoom, and that's been available for our office managers to be on the CBR side of the house, so called like a realty side of the house. It's been a, available to everyone. You could have used that for every office meeting if you wanted to. You know, you can hold your meeting and broadcast it. Many of our managers did, but nowhere near 100%. And the agents who tuned in, maybe a few now and then, maybe watched the recording a little bit. It was, it was kind of a, an afterthought. Now that we've made this this flip, our attendance at our weekly office meetings, for instance, is through the roof. I mean, between 85 and 100 percent across, and it's sustaining. It's not dropping. It's amazing. It's sustaining. So when we come back, we're thinking about, well, many managers did this before, but everyone should be have the in-person meeting. Agents are a gregarious sort. You know, we we want to get together, right? So have the in-person meeting, but also always broadcast it and always record it. So someone who's at a client appointment can see it later. Someone who misses it for whatever reason can, you know, can can listen in from afar, whatever it is. And those kinds of things lead to the the hybrid structure that John was talking about, which is that sort of leveraging technology to seamlessly create that hybrid experience. We're seeing our agents do it with consumers. We had over twelve thousand consumers tune into just one one broadcast we did wow. uh, just to learn about what's going on with the the market which is which is crazy we never would have predicted that uh, you know going in but that seamlessness that ability to to do some things in person some things virtually some things both leverage that virtual open house experience uh, be able to broadcast a message you know differently to consumers to agents that's what i think is going to become somewhat more borderless as we we move forward because everyone's gotten comfortable with it we could never have asked agents and customers to suddenly get comfortable with this type of medium the world did that for us COVID 19 did that for us so now how do we just continue to live and take advantage of that as we go forward just be more efficient and it's now not cool to be not cool with zoom so so uh, totally how many conference calls are now going to be in the future going to be 
video. Right? Endless, the, endless, the, endless. And, endless. and, that, and that's been, for me, that's been one of the changes I've observed is that um, we have to fly on planes as consultants to go do work with companies all the time. And how quickly people that we really wish would have been comfortable doing it over video now are. And how many people are turning on their video cameras just as a matter of course. They're just turning it on. They're like, oh, I don't look good. I'm going to leave it off. I'm going to say, and it's, it's, uh, it really flips fast. And for all of our meetings with all of our clients, happened yeah. like within a week's was just done. So I think you're absolutely right, Ryan. I, I'm also curious if you're seeing, again, because you've got a big network, you're connected. We're looking at different data sources. We're looking at the, the showing time data. There's some very large MLSs we're connected to. What are you learning about the real estate market? What's kind of, what's your sense of that? We have a, an interpretation of the market where it looks like activity is picking up, but what, what do you guys see and kind of what does it look like with the, across the, your network? So yeah, we can both speak to that. I mean, John, John, do you want to speak to some of what we're, what we're seeing so far? I can start generally at the realty level. We we literally um, just had our, our earnings call, so we have some you know very recent information that's now that's now public. You know, and, and sort of the way the way we're shaping the story is um, Q1 was super strong for us, and it was for the industry as well. Mm -hmm. So we were off to a great start before the pandemic hit, um, which suggests that there is um, pent up demand waiting to you know to spring forward when this when this starts to clear up, you know, interest rates are low, et cetera. And so, um, you know, that's all was sort of encouraging before this started and remains encouraging for us. You know, we're, we're seeing um, um, double and triple digit growth on our websites in terms of, of search and things like that. And so that consumers are re-entering the market um, from a search perspective in the last couple of weeks. You know, we shared yesterday that our nationwide. So Realogy, when you look at all of our brands owned and franchised, we have 165,000 agents across the country and we're in 97 or 98 percent of the U.S. zip codes. So we look a lot like NAR, for example. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our, our closings are down about 20 percent nationwide, big range depending on the state and the market, yeah. and our opens, right, which we call a deal in progress but not yet closed, down about 40 percent. And those numbers both have plateaued the last couple of weeks or bottomed out at a plateau the last couple of weeks. So number one, being down 20 on closes, 40 on opens is actually better than we thought when this started, right? It's not hard to imagine that the whole industry could have been down 50, 60, 70%, right? Um, and so we, we're encouraged by where we seem to have landed and, and absent anything unknown about what the virus does in the summer and in the fall, you know, we're seeing what our CEO calls green shoots. So the West Coast cities that were the first affected in the first lockdown, we're starting to see better week over week data in San Francisco and in, in Seattle. Um, we're seeing markets like the Carolinas, the Florida Panhandle that are down only 10% are coming back to zero. So, you know, we are encouraged by what we think is the beginning of perhaps a slow summer recovery, but, you know, too soon to declare to declare it a trend, but the last couple of weeks seem to have steadied and there's some evidence of, of um, growth for the, for the future. Hmm. That's great. Yeah, that's that's great. A, I mean, I don't have much to add. I mean, it certainly wasn't concise, but it was accurate. So I think uh, <laughs> John covered it. <laughs> and you, we've, we've had one other conversation. We've got, we've got another conversation with some leaders that have talked about that there, there's maybe even the case to be made that people, people who maybe weren't in the market maybe we'll be getting into the market. I know that's a little speculative, but you know, it makes sense. You may have people that have discovered during this period, like, oh, like I know, I know a lot of people that work at large technology companies, like I'm in Austin, Texas, and Dell is here. And all the Dell employees, they're all staying home. And Dell's mm -hmm. giving them a stipend. I just, we talked to the Facebook team. The Facebook folks are like, yeah, everybody is at home for sure for the rest of the year and are being encouraged to do that. And so the speculation is there's some people who may want to change their housing situation because they want a better home office. They want more, a little bit more space to, because they're going to be working at home. Maybe them and their spouse are both working at home now. So I don't know, it's, I don't know if you have anything to comment on that, but it, 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 um, it has Absolutely. a really that I think that is, you're definitely going to see it. So no one can spend two months inside of a space and not want to make any kind of changes to that space, right? <laughs> Whether you want to change the space you're in, you want to make changes. So a lot of people are saying, well, 
you know, I, I know what I want to do when we come out of this. Uh, you know, John was mentioning the other day is is his landscaper's never been busier because he's saying everyone's staring at their yard, you know, 24 hours a day and saying, well, I want a knee wall here. I want to do something different here. From the interior space, the same thing. I think a lot of people are going to be getting quotes here in the near term of like, what if we moved this room, did this, build out a home office? Those quotes, anyone who's done home renovation anytime recently, Stefan's probably still smarting from the construction that he just did, but you know, retrofitting is expensive. And I think those quotes are going to drive a lot of listings. Like a lot of people are going to say, well, wait a second. It's almost that love it or listed effect. Like yeah. if we want something different, maybe what we want is something different. And I think it's going to drive a lot of that. In addition, I think you've, you've had a lot of the hottest markets in the country where inventory has been the most constrained are also some of the highest traffic markets and some of the ones that skew more toward technology firms that have been a little more open to extending a work from home status. I think where you're going to have, including here with New York City, is a lot of people who say, you know what, especially some of the more senior folks, maybe I need to be in the city a couple, three days a week. Maybe it's not five days a week. And maybe that means I don't need to be 35 minutes on the train. I can be up to 55 minutes on the train, which starts to positively impact affordability trends as well, because you've had a lot of that inventory constraint driving down affordability. And as people start to think more broadly and say, maybe I can tolerate a longer commute if I'm only coming in once in a while. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and talk about being able to, to flip the script on affordability in this country in a way that no one would have predicted. No housing affordability experts out there saying, you know what we need to do is just like make everyone work from home. And yet that might be what we see from this. So I think you can drive volume and unit uh, transactions in the industry up and at the same time improve affordability, which that's not the kind of thing we would be able to do at the same time. Another interesting trend which no, might sorry, follow on. Sorry, go ahead, John. I was going to add tack on two things to follow. One is, um, I, I, I think that was a yes, no question, Ryan, and you clocked in at four and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say I've learned a lot from you, John. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I will say, you know, to build on what Ryan said, Jack, is that the, um, the, when you, when, you know, we analyze our search terms and things like that, you know, the, the, there's an increase in um, first time home buyers, you know, mm -hmm. when we analyze search, there's an increase in, as Ryan was saying, suburban homes. So, you know, I think, I think that there's, there's several aspects of this that drive change. Urban livers, you know, in, in Boston, in New York, um, may not even be moving, but are looking for second homes. And we're seeing that in Greenwich, we're seeing that in the Hamptons, we're seeing that in Westchester. Um, and I think, like Ryan said, I think if, if somebody could figure out how to identify every um, um, human who is working from home at their dining room table with their two students, um, and their spouse and can uh, offer a, you know, bolt on office to a home, that is, that is the future in terms of the millions to be made. I think it's all about home offices going forward. There's a new franchise opportunity for Realogy, bolt on offices. <laughs> the, the, the angle I wanted to follow up on, on Ryan was with roughly, we were playing with numbers the other day, with roughly in the ballpark of 35 million people who have filed for unemployment, therefore theoretically jobless, <laughs> sitting at home at the moment, if only 5% of them, one in 20, decided to enter the real estate industry as a potential career opportunity, we could double the size of NAR immediately with 5% of all the jobless people at the moment. <laughs> that, is, that is dramatic. And it will be interesting to see what happens with some of the independent contractor trends inside and outside real estate, but also some, you know, obviously real estate is a limitless profession, mm -hmm. but there's also no safety net. Right. So, uh, you know, what kind of choices people make this a little bit different in the future? It'll be interesting to see. We, we had we had somebody ask us the other day on a call. Well, does that mean that people are going to be leaving the industry? Do we have consolidation? Is it the end of the small company? And I said for every thousand or two thousand or three thousand companies going out of business, there'll probably be another thousand or two thousand entrepreneurs entering the business and thinking this is my opportunity. I want to make a difference. So we probably will have probably as many losses as we will have gains. So we shouldn't, worry about, we shouldn't worry about everybody leaving. Those are the ones, the ones which are leaving are the ones which probably wouldn't have made it anyways, or they weren't really long-term players in any event, or they didn't really, they weren't really committed. The ones which are going to make it are the ones which want to make it. They're committed. Let the ones and go, they don't want to go. Something we are seeing in the data almost universally, virtually every, every market is a, a much greater concentration of production in the top quartile. Mm, mm. So those who were leading their markets are gathering more share more quickly. And this, this was a trend in the pre-COVID first quarter, but by the end of the first quarter, it was a trend that had accelerated. Sort of like your opening point about additional acceleration of those trends. 
So that level of concentration is, is I, I'm, I've been surprised at how consistent that is across markets right now. It's really, it's dramatic. And if we, if we just casually debate that, that's actually right. That's actually what should happen, right? Because sure. in a great market, anybody can make money because anybody can sell because the busy guys, are the, the good guys are busy. They don't get you anything. So lots of people get scraps that fall off the table. But when the market gets tough, it's the, it's the strong guy, the good guy, the producer, the top producer that says, well, okay, I know what I have to do. I'm willing to do it. I'm in for the long haul. So I'm going to do it harder, better, more, more creative, more consistently. Mm -hmm. And it's the, I don't want to say weaker, but the weaker, more part-time, more casual person, which might say, oh, you know, COVID's really taken my market share away. Yeah. Strong guy says flight to quality. I think we're seeing flight to quality by consumers saying like, look, I, this is a very uncertain time. I need more than ever that advice, that counsel from someone who really knows what they're doing. Flight to quality by agents saying, I'm not, you know, I'm a, I'm a little uncertain now as to the affiliation that I have here, whether or not my, my broker's in it to win it, whether my broker's communicated with me the way that I'm hearing others have, supporting me, is going to be there for the long haul, can sustain themselves. And the flight quality the brokers affiliating with the, the top brands and saying, I, I, I know what I need now, and it's more than what I thought I needed before. And I, I think we're going to be a big, I think Realogy is going to be a big beneficiary of uh, the flight to quality. But I think a lot of the top agents are, are as well. And I don't want that to make people not enter the profession because every top agent started somewhere. And the agents who enter in the most difficult time during the Great Recession, during the interest rate spikes, during the oil shocks, the agents who enter during the most difficult time are oftentimes the agents who learned in the toughest time, cut their teeth then, and became the best practitioners in the industry. So Whoever joined in, you know, February and got their license, uh, they, they might be your future top professional. That might be the beginning of it. One of the chapters for the trends report, Jack. I like it. Flight to quality. I'm going to put that down as an idea. It's for a great, us. It's cool. a great title, Stefan. It's a great yep. title. Yeah, yep. that works. Um, <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Ryan, for that. <laughs> That's excellent. So, um, and I, I guess I'm also curious as to what, what have your franchisees or broker owners, what have they been asking you guys for? Are there, are there particular areas where they say, Hey, we need more of something or we, you know, this is really valuable to us. Or is it, what are you hearing through the network where people are finding value or wanting value or, or wanting something either different, better or faster from you guys? Uh, what, what's, what's your network say? I think that's changed over the course of the eight weeks. You know, the, the, the first, the first three or four weeks, um, it was it was actually a, a new topic, which was we were getting asked for advice and guidance on how to access PPP and the small business loans and to navigate all of that. And so, you know, we pivoted quickly to becoming expert, right, on on how small businesses can tap into all the federal assistance, and and the content for many of our calls with our owners that we were doing once and twice a week by brand was bringing CPAs and attorneys and, and, and everything that we were learning to share with them um, mm -hmm. how to access the, the federally available funds. So, so again, I think, you know, Realogy became a source of information because, you know, we're tapped into to DC and the White House and the Chamber of Commerce and, and all of that. So I think we became a, we became a, a, a link between the federal government and the programming and our, and our affiliates. Now, in the last couple of weeks, it's definitely shifting much more toward um, you know, virtual tools and the virtual tools that we're offering, the rapid enhancements we're making to the tools we already have, um, them having discovered some new tool that they want us to look at and, and validate for them or help them um, use. So I think it's shifting now back to the tools that they want to use, which of course are much more virtual. Uh, but it, it's only, I, and, you know, I, I, Ryan, we'll see what you think. But in the last couple of weeks, it's more about real estate tools. The first couple of weeks, it was about helping them get yeah. their ship notes in order. Yeah, it's about finding access to financing and access to, you know, help making with cash flow and things yeah. like that. Yeah, so I, I completely agree. And I think that's another sort of the, the flight to quality that sort of lean toward the trusted advisor. You're seeing that in there too, because there's no shortage of information about the CARES Act. I mean, as soon as the thing was passed, you know, every news outlet in the world, you know, you Google it, there's a million different things. But what there was also no shortage was misinformation and speculation and guesstimates and poor guidance. So our, our agents, our affiliates and their customers, we ended up doing a lot. I've done a ton of these uh, calls with customers, agents pulling together the customers for Zoom calls and those customers being able to ask us questions. 
because we're an authoritative source and we take it seriously, like we are, we are a publicly traded company, world's most ethical company. We get the information, we, we vet it, we think very carefully about it and we share it out with folks. There is an enormous yearning for that from, from consumers, from agents and from brokers. Not that they couldn't get information, but they didn't trust what they were hearing. So to be able to come to someone, come to us, come to our brands and be able to say like, I'm, I'm hearing this. We say, nope, actually that, that's not accurate. Here's what is, or here's the right source. Here's the person to contact. That was really, really appreciated, even though we were, on, we were just shepherding them in the most, most part, not creating new information, but it was deeply appreciated. Mm -hmm. It was kind of moderating that content and, and helping it be more specific and just guiding them through. Because I, I, we saw the same thing. I think, you know, half of, half of uh, sure. all businesses created some guide to small, you know, small business for their, you know, their constituencies uh, in the industry. And uh, yep. a lot of that is just, a lot of that is just being a good moderator and saying, hey, it's, it's here, go here. Yep. So. so a question pop in from somebody on the call asking, do we have any suggestions or ideas for agents that are really struggling? Um, some companies are, are strong or public or big, but what happens to the agent that's really, it just happens to be unfortunately those ones that no sales, no market. Any suggestions there? So it depends on the reason why, right? So for instance, if they're in uh, New York City, a, a market that John knows extremely well, he could speak to, uh, there's not much happening in that market. And so that's, you know, in terms of what you can do about it, it's more of preparedness and planning and, and discussions with your existing prospective clients in the future to plan for when you come out of this. In much of the country, that's not the case. As John talked about our numbers, we're not down that much across the board, even including New York City in our average numbers. So if there it's not happening, Honestly, it, it, it may be a level of proactivity and confidence of the individuals who are trying to reach out to their, to their clients or waiting for their clients to reach out to them. So very strong suggestion that, that has proven to work for a lot of agents uh, is getting out there, creating forum for your clients to be able to communicate with one another, with your prospects, holding a Zoom call, just to answer any questions they may have, pulling in experts, local experts, you know, get, grab your mayor, your police chief, a local carpenter, someone, you know, an electrician, someone who might be able to answer questions that are likely on people's minds about their home renovation, what's going on in their community or something about housing, create those opportunities and reach out to those individuals and I often talk about asking them how they're doing. And then after they just flippantly say like, great, how are you? Then ask again. And like, but how are you really doing? What's really going there? Get that next level, uh, bring that empathy so you can then make those connections, which might not be housing related immediately, but they will inevitably associate you with the helpfulness and informative nature that, uh, that is our industry. Right. And that will help the business to grow. Yep. Good, good, good. Uh, I can also, I can also think that Jack and um, his team of consultants uh, under the guidance of, of Dean, and I know Mark's participated, Kelly's participated, Jonathan's participated, have a webinar which we do every week on Tuesdays called Tactical Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. You can go to just prepare.t360.com, prepare.t360.com, and they have uh, been, where this call is more on a slightly higher level with CEOs, the calls on Tuesday, very practical, very grassroots, where they went through what you could do on savings if you were a broker, what you could do as agent, how you could recruit more agents, how you could reposition agents, how you could derive additional income, other sources. So there's a, been, I think there's been what, Jack, about seven, six, seven think, of those? Yeah, points? I think we've done seven of those so far. Last week we did um, a, a great one on uh, how to leverage what you're getting through your MLS and association in order to you know, build, your, build your business or sustain business or be ready for it when it comes back. And so Clint Scuchin led that one. It's a very, very good call. Right. So, I see. I, yeah, so we, we've been doing those every week with something that's practical, that's takeaway, that, yep. that's actionable now. I see Chris Thank Riley you. and our team just popped up the URL there on the chat box. So, so thanks, Chris. So that right. one is more, the, we had that one more on the practical side, the, the management side, the hands-on side. Uh, there's some PDFs which you can download. And then this call here, we're on a slightly slightly higher level, sort of the, the bigger picture. I know I've done a bunch of calls, uh, uh, John. Uh, I think three of your brands have reached out. I did one for uh, ERA and Sherry Chris reached out at BH&G and Mike reached out on C21. I did some C21 calls. Um, and I think I have another one for your uh, actually non-brand calls. I was actually very impressed. You guys are doing fantastic work with companies that are not even in your brands. Uh, I was going to, I was going to build on what Ryan, or, yeah, I was going to build on what Ryan Gorman was just saying. And, 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 you know, what we're coaching agents who are either slow because they're in a, in a market where there's no business 
or they're slow because they're just sort of overwhelmed by the virus and can't sort of, you know, um, figure out a path forward is, you know, number one, invest in, in learning and training. And we're seeing record numbers accessing our learning programs. Second thing is to, you know, invest in their social media platforms so that they're current, up to date and ready to own the upswing. And then the third thing is, you know, how do you reach out to people? It's not a time for a, a tough sell. It's a time for a hard sell. It's time for a soft, a soft, how are you doing, like Ryan said. And, and so what we've done on the, um, you know, we're in the business of franchise sales on the franchise side, right? And so we, we, we have 65 salespeople around the world and in the U.S. who knock on the doors of independent real estate companies and encourage them to join one of our brands and, to, and we sell our value proposition. And so, um, you know, now's not the time to be hard selling, you know, independent companies who are struggling. And so what we thought was a better way to connect is to um, do for independent companies what we're doing for the owners of our brands. And so smart. every week, Very smart. Every, every week we're having a call um, and, you know, we started out talking about CARES, the CARES Act and PPP. We start, we talked about how to manage expenses and things like that. So we're trying to just share with them the advice we give to our owners. And what's fascinating is we have, we have 500 companies that have registered for the program, all independents, and we get two to 300 on a call. Um, and and you know, we're not promoting our brands, but obviously we are letting them see the benefit of being part of the larger Realogy network. And, and that's the same advice I would give to a real estate agent right now, which is reaching out to your, your individual sphere of influence and your past customers to just check in, let them know what's going on, ask how they're doing, um, connect them with experts, as Ryan said. That's what people are valuing right now. They're, just, they're valuing information and connection, and, and we're seeing that at, you know, as an example of this call that you're going to join next week. Thank you for doing that. Uh, I think it's very, very smart. I think it's very prudent. I think it's very responsible. Uh, we did something. We, of course, not a franchise. We, we're not in real estate as a broker or franchise or have no intentions to ever be categorically out of that. But as a consulting company, we offer consulting services. And we too, at the moment, feel that we don't want to sign new contracts. We don't want to push. We don't want to bring on new clients. Uh, we don't want to sell consulting. So we decided that we would actually open up consulting for two months, the month of April, and the month of May, for free. Of course, it's limited. It, we can't come and visit your offices. Oh. But we said that if you're not a client at the moment of T3, if you're a client, we're already working with you. But if you're not a client with T3, if you have any problem on any matter whatsoever, we will give you half an hour or an hour free consulting over the phone. You can speak to us and we will try our best to help you, address you, solve you, get you the information, get you the data, no charge whatsoever. And we just called it Ask T3. And you can just go to the website. We created a new website, Ask T3, free, no charge. So it's the same principle, right? Because it's what we do in any event for our clients. And we've not, we've not had as many of you. We've, we've only had, but we've had 46 non-T3 clients call us and say, listen, we'd love to have hired you, but we can't afford you. We haven't worked with you in the past, but we would like some advice on this or this or this or this. And, and again, you're, you're helping somebody with something which you can do in your stride. It's not really, doesn't cost us a lot. It's not expensive. It's not effort, but it feels good. And it feels like you're helping somebody. So I like your idea at, a lot. At, time, at, at a time like this, it's just the right thing to do. I, yeah. I applaud you for it. I think it's terrific. I agree. And I, I, one of the things you're talking about, like sort of what will change in the, in the future, hopefully things like that don't change. Uh, it, not that your services should always be free, but hopefully the, uh, our, our ability to just sort of think differently and move quickly and not let the fears of well, what would happen if, like you could have sat there, if this came up under normal circumstances in your exec code meeting and someone said, hey, well, what if we just offered our services for free for a while? I'm sure you would have all been like, well, wait a second, a thousand people call us, we can't possibly do it. There's only so many hours in a day, we can't, buy. but you didn't. Instead, you just, you just did it, so let's see, what, let's see what happens. That's so true about so many things. The number of programs, opportunities, services that I've heard get shot down because what if it's insanely successful, as opposed to those companies like yours, like ours, that sort of say, you know what, let's just try it and deal with that extremely high class problem when we get there and people will understand. I couldn't encourage people enough to take that second mindset with everything they're thinking about doing you'll learn so much more you'll be so much less intimidated and, and sort of fear riddled and you'll 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 succeed it's easy to have an opinion and to be negative if you haven't tried and stepped out to do something step up and do something and you'll actually find that it's probably easier and better than what you thought 
Uh, Jack, another no, a good question from you. So no, I mean this is a, a great conversation. So I'm th well, we, I think we're all on the same page right now, giving back to the industry and supporting the industry. And, and Stefan, if I've had that conversation about, hey, I think we're going to keep doing some of these things after this is over. So in some ways, it's the silver lining that I think comes out of this is that I think we're all learning that there's some things that we get to keep. And I wanted to find out from you, gentlemen, what are you personally going to keep? from this? What's something you're going to take away? I know I've got a few things I'm going to take away. It may be sourdough bread, as my wife will tell you. I've become an addict. We may keep that one. That one, our own homemade bread has turned out really good. Uh, gardening, I may keep that. But what are you guys going to keep from this, uh, this time? Or what do you want to keep? Personally, interesting. Um, so one thing, in the first two weeks that this all went down, I was, you know, cooped up in a house, probably sitting in this chair, and only went outside. I realized I only went outside to take the garbage out. Uh, and that was like just incredibly unhealthy. When I realized that, I started walking uh, in the morning before everyone gets up, before the town wakes up. Uh, I go out and walk. I, I do Audible. Uh, so, you know, I, I hammer through uh, books that I otherwise maybe wouldn't get a chance to go through. And now I'm doing that a couple hours every morning, which I never would have thought that I even could make that time before. But now I just do it reflexively. I feel so much better about it. John and I used to Back when we were in headquarters, whenever we weren't on a plane, which unfortunately we were pretty much always on a plane, but when we weren't, that's how we would do our meetings. We would, we, the two of us would go for, for uh, long walks, which always made everyone suspicious of what we could possibly be talking about, but we just wanted to get outside and get some exercise. Uh, so we picked that up the other day. Uh, we were saying we kind of missed one another. And uh, so now we, we went on a, you know, a, a sunrise walk the other day, both uh, with our headphones in, uh, him walking right. his dog and me cruising around the neighborhood. So I'm hoping we're going to keep some of that going. I'm going to keep walking. We're going to keep connecting. That's awesome. John, on your side, what's a nice takeaway for you? I, I agree. Um, one, one takeaway personally is, is um, you know, my, my children are 22 and 19. And um, whoever thought that we would have dinner together seven <laughs> nights for eight weeks ever again. Mm. Um, and in addition to that, you know, my 30 year career, I've always been away from home, you know, on planes or working past dinner time. So I, I was never a home five nights a week for dinner guy. I was home two nights a week or something like that. So, you know, my wife and I and the kids have just said, we have this gift that's befallen us right now of eight going on, who knows how many more weeks of dinner together. And um, we're surprising ourselves with how much we're enjoying it. Although we all think three or four might be the sweet spot versus seven, but um, you know, and so I think, I think we're learning that that's a connection we want to figure out how to keep going is, as the kids actually, you know, move on in more adult lives. It's a, it's really been a, I think, a, an unexpected blessing from all of this. I think a lot of people have that realization too, back when I, I was doing investment banking and consulting, the number of times I flew across the country for what ended up being a 35 minute meeting. I mean, I can't even count how many times that happened. And that's fine. I never lamented it. It was fine. That's just what we did. You know, like wake up before dawn, you get home after midnight and you have that 35 minute meeting. This will do a lot of things. One, you know, if it's debating between having dinner with my family that night or doing that 35 minute meeting, I think, you know, dinner with my family is going to win now more often than it used to. But also I won't wait three weeks for the 35 minute meeting because that's the time that it fit into my travel calendar. I'll just say, great, let's talk this afternoon. Let's talk tomorrow morning. Let's accelerate the pace of, of this discussion, this project, this relationship, uh, because we can do this. Mm. Jack, some closing points from you well, before I wrap it up? I, 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 think, I think the speed and the agility with which an organization as large as yours can move is impressive. So I want to say, awesome job. Uh, we're working with some of your larger franchisees and it, it filters down to that level. So um, keep providing leadership. It's, it's great. And uh, great. I do think we get to keep, keep a lot out of this. It's going to be good. So thank you for your leadership, for your, your teams and your people. That's terrific. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for putting these on. These are, these are, are terrific. Normally, I mean, when I'm making fun of John, like no one gets to see it. And, um, <laughs> and I really feel like the world needs to know. <laughs> they do need to know. It's been what it's been a, a, like a little treasure we just uncovered here. Is this relationship you guys have is, is quite fun, quite fun. <laughs> John, what we could maybe do is if we go to the T3 summit, we'll put we'll put uh, Jack and, and Ryan on a team, and I'll go on your team, and we'll we'll tee up two against two. And we'll see we'll see how they'll do. You want to even up the odds a little bit, Stefan? I, I see what you're doing. Uh, well, well, from my side, um, uh, this year I've been married to my wife for 40 years. 
And she said that she's wow. never, ever, ever seen so much of me. She said we had 24 by 7 before, but that meant that I was away seven days out of every 24 at least. Uh, so she didn't, she didn't see me that frequently. I don't think I've ever seen her eight weeks contiguously for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, contiguously in 40 years of marriage. I mean, it's always been interrupted. Yeah. So like you, John, my kids are a little bit, little bit older, but they like you, they're, they're, they're adults, they're 32, 30, roughly 30, 33 and 31. So they're, they're a little bit older, but um, the time which we now recalibrate to do different things, as Ryan said, I also have flown from the West Coast to the East Coast to go give a talk to somebody for, for 60 minutes. And although I love being on stage and I enjoy it, it is a long day to give up if you're going to be on a meeting or on a stage for 30 or 60 minutes. And I think we'll have much less face-to-face -face meetings in the future, maybe less conventions. I hope the T3 will be one of the ones which will survive. I think it will. I think it's got something more special than just an event. But I think many events that were maybe a little bit more bland or a little bit more neutral, we might find a reason not to go to those anymore. Uh, so we'll be, we'll be more choosy of our time and the time which we spend with the people which we love. So Jack's already said thank you. I'll say thank you again on behalf of the industry, of our of T3, towards the Rilogy. Uh, you guys are a large company. I know you've had a lot of pressure, a lot of stress. The market's not been kind to you, but you've actually held up exceptionally well. And I think your leadership has done very well. And I'm impressed with the leadership of the industry in, in, as a general. Your company, as well as some of your competitors, you guys have all stepped up. And it's, it's delightful to be part of an industry which you guys care so much. Thank you for your time today very much. Thank you. Thanks for having Thanks, us. Thanks, gentlemen. Glad you're healthy, John. Please stay safe. Look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Appreciate it. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Care, Bye, -bye.